Section 4, Chapters 11 through 14 of The Monk and the Hangman's Daughter by Ambrose Bierce. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The monastery has celebrated a great festival, and I will report all that occurred. For many days before the event the brothers were busy preparing for it. Some decorated the church with sprays of pine and birch and with flowers. They went with the other men and gathered the most beautiful alpine roses they could find, and, as it is midsummer, they grow in great abundance. On the day before the festival the brothers sat in the garden, weaving garlands to adorn the church, and even the most reverend superior and the fathers took pleasure in our merry task. They walked beneath the trees and chatted pleasantly, while encouraging the brother butler to spend freely the contents of the cellars. The next morning was the holy procession. It was very beautiful to see, and added to the glory of our holy church. The superior walked under a purple silken canopy, surrounded by the worthy fathers, and bore in his hands the sacred emblem of the crucifixion of our Saviour. We brothers followed, bearing burning candles and singing psalms. Behind us came a great crowd of the people dressed in their finest attire. The proudest of those in the procession were the mountaineers and the salt miners, the salt master at their head on a beautiful horse adorned with costly trappings. He was a proud-looking man, with his great sword at his side, and a plumed hat upon his broad high brow. Behind him rode Rokus, his son. When we had collected in front of the gate to form a line, I took special notice of that young man. I judged him to be self-willed and bold. He wore his hat on the side of his head, and cast flaming glances upon the women and the maidens. He looked contemptuously upon us monks. I fear he is not a good Christian, but he is the most beautiful youth that I have ever seen, tall and slender like a young pine, with light brown eyes and golden locks. The salt-master is as powerful in this region as our superior. He is appointed by the duke, and has judicial powers in all affairs. He has even the power of life and death over those accused of murder or any other abominable crime. But the Lord has fortunately endowed him with good judgment and wisdom. Through the village the procession moved out into the valley, and down to the entrances of the great salt mines. In front of the principal mine an altar was erected, and there our superior read high mass, while all the people knelt. I observed that the salt-master and his son knelt and bent their heads with visible reluctance, and this made me very sad. After the service the procession moved toward the hill called Mount Calvary, which is still higher than the monastery, and from the top of which one has a good view of the whole country below. There the reverend superior displayed the crucifix in order to banish the evil powers which abound in these terrible mountains, and he also said prayers and pronounced anathemas against all demons infesting the valley below. The bells chimed their praises to the Lord, and it seemed as if divine voices were ringing through the wilderness. It was all indeed most beautiful and good. I looked about me to see if the child of the hangman was present, but I could not see her anywhere and knew not whether to rejoice that she was out of reach of the insults of the people, or to mourn because deprived of the spiritual strength that might have come to me from looking upon her heavenly beauty. After the services came the feast. Upon a meadow sheltered by trees tables were spread, and the clergy and the people, the most reverend superior and the great salt-master, partook of the viands served by the young men. It was interesting to see the young men make big fires of pine and maple, put great pieces of beef upon wooden spits, turn them over the coals until they were brown, and then lay them before the fathers and the mountaineers. They also boiled mountain trout and carp in large kettles. The wheaten bread was brought in immense baskets, and as to drink, there was assuredly no scarcity of that for the superior and the salt-master had each given a mighty cask of beer. Both of these monstrous barrels lay on wooden stands under an ancient oak. The boys and the salt-master's men drew from the cask which he had given, while that of the superior was served by the brother butler and a number of us younger monks. In honor of St. Franciscus I must say that the clerical barrel was of vastly greater size than that of the salt-master. 
Separate tables had been provided for the superior and the fathers, and for the salt-master and the best of his people. The salt-master and the superior sat upon chairs which stood upon a beautiful carpet, and their seats were screened from the sun by a linen canopy. At the table, surrounded by their beautiful wives and daughters, sat many knights who had come from their distant castles to share in the great festival. I helped the table, I handed the dishes and filled the goblets, and was able to see how good an appetite the company had, and how they loved that brown and bitter drink. I could see also how amorously the saltmaster's son looked at the ladies, which provoked me very much, as he could not marry them all especially those already married. We had music, too. Some boys from the village who practiced on various instruments in their spare moments were the performers. Ah, how they yelled those flutes and pipes, and how the fiddle-bows danced and chirped! I do not doubt the music was very good, but heaven has not seen fit to give me the right kind of ears. I am sure our blessed saint must have derived great satisfaction from the sight of so many people eating and drinking their bellies full. Heavens, how they did eat! What unearthly quantities they did away with! But that was nothing to their drinking. I firmly believe that if every mountaineer had brought along a barrel of his own, he would have emptied it all by himself. But the women seemed to dislike the beer, especially the young girls. Usually before drinking a young man would hand his cup to one of the maids, who barely touched it with her lips, and making a grimace turned away her face. I am not sufficiently acquainted with the ways of woman to say with certainty if this proved that at other times they were so abstemious. After eating the young men played at various games which exhibited their agility and strength. Holy Franciscus! What legs they have! What arms and necks! They leapt, they wrestled with one another. It was like the fighting of bears. The mere sight of it caused me to feel great fear. It seemed as if they would crush one another. But the maidens looked on, feeling neither fear nor anxiety. They giggled and appeared well pleased. It was wonderful, too, to hear the voices of these young mountaineers. They threw back their heads and shouted till the echoes rang from the mountainsides and roared in the gorges as if from the throats of a legion of demons. Foremost among all was the saltmaster's son. He sprang like a deer, fought like a fiend, and bellowed like a wild bull. Among these mountaineers he was a king. I observed that many were jealous of his strength and beauty, and secretly hated him, yet all obeyed. It was beautiful to see how this young man bent his slender body while leaping and playing the games, how he threw up his head like a stag at gaze, shook his golden locks, and stood in the midst of his fellows with flaming cheeks and sparkling eyes. How sad to think that pride and passion should make their home in so lovely a body, which seems created for the habitation of a soul that would glorify its Maker. It was near dusk when the superior, the salt-master, the fathers, and all the distinguished guests parted and retired to their homes, leaving the others at drink and dance. My duties compelled me to remain with the brother butler to serve the debauching youths with beer from the great cask. Young Rokus remained too. I do not know how it occurred, but suddenly he stood before me. His looks were dark and his manner proud. Are you, he said, the monk who gave offence to the people the other day? I asked humbly, though beneath my monk's robe I felt a sinful anger, what are you speaking of? As if you did not know, he said haughtily. Now bear in mind what I tell you. If you ever show any friendship toward that girl, I shall teach you a lesson which you will not soon forget. You monks are likely to call your impertinence by the name of some virtue, but I know the trick, and will have none of it. Make a note of that, you young cowl-wearer, for your handsome face and big eyes will not save you." With that he turned his back upon me and went away, but I heard his strong voice ringing out upon the night as he sang and shouted with the others. I was greatly alarmed to learn that this bold boy had cast his eyes upon the hangman's lovely daughter. His feeling for her was surely not honorable, 
or instead of hating me for being kind to her, he would have been grateful and would have thanked me. I feared for the child, and again and again did I promise my blessed saint that I would watch over and protect her in obedience to the miracle which he has wrought in my breast regarding her. With that wondrous feeling to urge me on, I cannot be slack in my duty, and, Benedicta, thou shalt be saved, thy body and thy soul. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Let me continue my report. The boys threw dry brushwood into the fire, so that the flames illuminated the whole meadow and shone red upon the trees. Then they laid hands upon the village maidens, and began to turn and swing them round and round. Holy saints! How they stamped and turned and threw their hats in the air, kicked up their heels and lifted the girls from the ground, as if the sturdy winches were nothing but feather balls. They shouted and yelled as if all the evil spirits had them in possession, so that I wished a herd of swine might come, that the devils might leave these human brutes and go into the four-legged ones. The boys were quite full of the brown beer, which, for its bitterness and strength, is a beastly drink. Before long the madness of intoxication broke out. They attacked one another with fists and knives, and it looked as if they would do murder. Suddenly the salt-master's son, who had stood looking on, leaped among them, caught two of the combatants by the hair, and knocked their heads together with such force that the blood started from their noses, and I thought surely their skulls had been crushed like eggshells. But they must have been very hard-headed, for on being released they seemed little worse for their punishment. After much shouting and screaming, Rochus succeeded in making peace, which seemed to me, poor worm, quite heroic. The music set in again, the fiddles scraped, and the pipes shrieked, while the boys with torn clothes and scratched and bleeding faces renewed the dance as if nothing had occurred. Truly, this is a people that would gladden the heart of a Ramarbus or a Holofernes. I had scarcely recovered from the fright which Rochus had given me when I was made to feel a far greater one. Rochus was dancing with a tall and beautiful girl who looked the very queen of this young king. They made such mighty leaps and dizzy turns, but at the same time so graceful that all looked on with astonishment and pleasure. The girl had a sensuous smile on her lips and a bold look in her brown face, which seemed to say, See, I am the mistress of his heart. But suddenly he pushed her from him as in disgust, broke from the circle of dancers and cried to his friends, I am going to bring my own partner. Who will go with me? The tall girl, maddened by the insult, stood looking at him with the face of a demon, her black eyes burning like the flames of hell. But her discomfiture amused the drunken youths, and they laughed aloud. Snatching a firebrand and swinging it about his head till the sparks flew in showers, Rochus cried again, Who goes with me? and walked rapidly away into the forest. The others, seizing firebrands also, ran after him, and soon their voices could be heard far away, ringing out upon the night, themselves no longer seen. I was still looking in the direction which they had taken, when the tall girl whom Rochus had insulted stepped to my side and hissed something into my ear. I felt her hot breath on my cheek. If you care for the hangman's daughter, then hasten and save her from that drunken wretch. No woman resists him. God, how the wild words of that woman horrified me! I did not doubt the girl's words, but in my anxiety for the poor child I asked, how can I save her? Run and warn her, monk, the wench replied. She will listen to you. But they will find her sooner than I. They are drunk and will not go fast. Besides, I know a path leading to the hangman's hut by a shorter route. Then show me and be quick, I cried. She glided away, motioning me to follow. We were soon in the woods, where it was so dark I could hardly see the woman's figure, but she moved as fast and her step was as sure as in the light of day. Above us we could see the torches of the boys, which showed that they had taken the longer path along the mountainside. I heard their wild shouts and trembled for the child. We had walked for some time in silence, having left the youths far behind, when the young woman began speaking to herself, 
At first I did not understand, but soon my ears caught every passionate word. He shall not have her. To the devil with the hangman's whelp. Every one despises her and spits at the sight of her. It is just like him. He does not care for what people think or say. Because they hate, he loves. Besides, she has a pretty face. I'll make it pretty for her. I'll mark it with blood. But if she were the daughter of the devil himself, he would not rest until he had her. He shall not. She lifted her arms and laughed wildly. I shuddered to hear her. I thought of the dark powers that live in the human breast, though I know as little of them, thank God, as a child. At length we reached Galgenberg, where stands the hangman's hut, and a few moments' climb brought us near the door. "'There she lives,' said the girl, pointing to the hut, through the windows of which shone the yellow light of a tallow candle. "'Go warn her. The hangman is ill and unable to protect his daughter, even if he dared. You'd better take her away. Take her to the outfield on the goal, where my father has a house. They will not look for her up there.' With that she left me and vanished in the darkness. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 Looking in at the window of the hut, I saw the hangman sitting in a chair, with his daughter beside him, her hand upon his shoulder. I could hear him cough and groan, and knew that she was trying to soothe him in his pain. A world of love and sorrow was in her face, which was more beautiful than ever. Nor did I fail to observe how clean and tidy were the room and all in it. The humble dwelling looked indeed like a place blessed by the peace of God. Yet these blameless persons are treated as accursed and hated like mortal sin. What greatly pleased me was an image of the Blessed Virgin on the wall opposite the window at which I stood. The frame was decorated with flowers of the field, and the mantle of the Holy Mother festooned with edelweiss. I knocked at the door calling out at the same time, Do not fear, it is I, Brother Ambrosius. It seemed to me that on hearing my voice and name, Benedicta showed a sudden joy in her face, but perhaps it was only surprise. May the saints preserve me from the sin of pride. She came to the window and opened it. Benedicta, said I hastily, after returning her greeting, wild and drunken boys are on their way hither to take you to the dance. Rokus is with them, and says that he will fetch you to dance with him. I have come before them to assist you to escape." At the name of Rokus I saw the blood rise into her cheeks and suffuse her whole face with crimson. Alas, I perceived that my jealous guide was right. No woman could resist that beautiful boy, not even this pious and virtuous child. When her father comprehended what I said, he rose to his feet and stretched out his feeble arms, as if to shield her from harm. But although his soul was strong, his body, I knew, was powerless. I said to him, Let me take her away. The boys are drunk and know not what they do. Your resistance would only make them angry, and they might harm you both. Ah, look, see their torches? Hear their boisterous voices? Hasten, Benedicta, be quick, be quick. Benedicta sprang to the side of the now sobbing old man and tenderly embraced him. Then she hurried from the room, and, after covering my hands with kisses, ran away into the woods, disappearing in the night, at which I was greatly surprised. I waited for her to return for a few minutes, then entered the cabin to protect her father from the wild youths who, I thought, would visit their disappointment upon him. But they did not come. I waited and listened in vain. All at once I heard shouts of joy and screams that made me tremble and pray to the blessed saint. But the sounds died away in the distance, and I knew that the boys had retraced their steps down the Galgenberg to the meadow of the fires. The sick man and I spoke of the miracle which had changed their hearts, and we were filled with gratitude and joy. Then I returned along the path by which I had come. As I arrived near the meadow I could hear a wilder and madder uproar than ever, and could see through the trees the glare of greater fires, with the figures of the youths and a few maids dancing in the open, their heads uncovered, their hair streaming over their shoulders, their garments disordered by the fury of their movements. They circled about the fires, wound in and out among them, showing black or red according to how the light struck them 
and looking altogether like demons of the pit commemorating some infernal anniversary or some new torment of the damned. And, O oh, holy Saviour, there in the midst of an illuminated space, upon which the others did not trespass, dancing by themselves and apparently forgetful of all else, were Rochus and Benedicta. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Holy Mother of God, what can be worse than the fall of an angel? I saw, I understood then, that in leaving me and her father, Benedicta had gone willingly to meet the very fate from which I had striven to save her. The accursed wench has run into Rochus's arms, hissed someone at my side, and turning I saw the tall brown girl who had been my guide, her face distorted with hate. I wish that I had killed her. Why did you suffer her to play us this trick, you fool of a monk? I pushed her aside and ran toward the couple without thinking what I did. But what could I do? Even at that instant, as though to prevent my interference, though really unconscious of my presence, the drunken youths formed a circle about them, bawling their admiration and clapping their hands to mark the time. As these two beautiful figures danced, they were a lovely picture. He, tall, slender, and lithe, was like a god of the heathen Greeks, while Benedicta looked like a fairy. Seen through the slight mist upon the meadows, her delicate figure, moving swiftly and swaying from side to side, seemed veiled with a web of purple and gold. Her eyes were cast modestly upon the ground, her motions, though agile, were easy and graceful. Her face glowed with excitement, and it seemed as if her whole soul was absorbed in the dance. Poor sweet child! Her error made me weep, but I forgave her. Her life was so barren and joyless. Why should she not love to dance? Heaven bless her! But Rochus! Ah, God forgive him! While I was looking on at all this, and thinking what it was my duty to do, the jealous girl, she is called Amula, had stood near me cursing and blaspheming. When the boys applauded Benedicta's dancing, Amula made as if she would spring forward and strangle her. But I held the furious creature back, and stepping forward called out, Benedicta! She started at the sound of my voice, but though she hung her head a little lower, she continued dancing. Amula could control her rage no longer, and rushed forward with a savage cry, trying to break into the circle. But the drunken boys prevented. They jeered at her, which maddened her the more, and she made effort after effort to reach her victim. The boys drove her away with shouts, curses, and laughter. Holy Franciscus, pray for us. When I saw the hatred in Amula's eyes, a cold shudder ran through my body. God be with us. I believe the creature capable of killing the poor child with her own hands and glorying in the deed. I ought now to have gone home, but I remained. I thought of what might occur when the dance was over, for I had been told that the youths commonly accompanied their partners home, and I was horrified to think of Rochus and Benedicta alone together in the forest and the night. Imagine my surprise when, all at once, Benedicta lifted her head, stopped dancing, and, looking kindly at Rochus, said in her sweet voice, so like the sound of silver bells, I thank you, sir, for having chosen me for your partner in the dance in such a knightly way. Then, bowing to the saltmaster's son, she slipped quickly through the circle, and before anyone could know what was occurring, disappeared in the black spaces of the forest. Rochus at first seemed stupefied with amazement, but when he realized that Benedicta was gone, he raved like a madman. He shouted, Benedicta! He called her endearing names, but all to no purpose. She had vanished. Then he hurried after her and wanted to search the forest with torches, but the other youths dissuaded him. Observing my presence, he turned his wrath upon me. I think if he had dared he would have struck me. He cried, I'll make you smart for this, you miserable cowl-wearer. But I do not fear him. Praise be to God, Benedicta is not guilty and I can respect her as before. Yet I tremble to think of the many perils which beset her. She is defenseless against the hate of Amula as well as against the lust of Rochus. 
ah, if I could be ever at her side to watch over and protect her! But I commend her to thee, O Lord. The poor motherless child shall surely not trust to thee in vain. End of chapter 14